So I wanted to share a little bit on something very important here that might help you even as we navigate our way through the busyness, the busy milieu of this hour, of this world, towards the glorious coming of the Messiah, our Lord. Well, uh, I want to talk a little bit today about Matthew 25 as a very important scripture that if we bring to heart can really go a long way in establishing our resolve to pursue the glorious coming of the Messiah, our Lord. Now, I have several versions here. I'll read Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, but I will focus on NIV for now. And uh, there is even Amplified, which I can read. I can read Amplified and then IV. So, in NIV he says, that at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Those of you who are tuned in, if you have the privilege and opportunity to have a piece of paper and pen, you can always write down some of the things that will come out of this conversation. And again it says at that time the kingdom of heaven would be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all, all, the wise and the foolish, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Verse 7, Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. Verse 8, the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Verse 9, No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Verse 10, But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said. You know, the other versions say, Lord, Lord. Here he says, Sir, sir, they said. Open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I do not know you. Then verse 13, he says, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So, I want to launch this conversation this evening, this very blessed conversation to people who are listening across the globe, and also terrestrially in Kenya and even via the web, the web streaming, I want to share some few very important observations I have made on this scripture. The Lord led me to, to make these following observations here. I know that uh, I have the Amplified also, and the Amplified says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, he says, thoughtless, without forethought, and five were wise, meaning sensible, intelligent, and prudent. So 
when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any extra oil with them. He says, extra oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil along with their lamps also. And along with them also with their lamps. While the bridegroom lingered and was slow in coming, they all began nodding their heads and fell asleep. Verse 6. He says, the midnight at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, go out to meet him. Verse 7 he says, Then all those virgins got up and put their own lamps in order, meaning they trimmed their wicks, and put their own lamps in order. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Verse 9 he says, But the wise replied, There will not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the dealers and buy, said dealers, to the dealers and buy for yourself. Verse 10 says, But while they were going away to buy, the, to buy, comma, the bride room came, and those who were prepared went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Later, other virgins, other, the, the, the foolish virgins, he says, other, later other virgins also came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. Verse 12, he replied, meaning from the inside, I solemnly declare unto you, I do not know you. I am not acquainted with you. Verse 13. Watch therefore, watch therefore, give strict attention and be cautious and active, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. So I think this is a very important conversation that ought today to be at the center of every discourse and every preaching that is currently ongoing in church. We see, first of all, that the, in this conversation, the Lord Jesus brought it about in the inside of a longer conversation, in the midst, in the middle, right? Uh, in the middle of a bigger conversation when the Lord Jesus was essentially talking about the end of the time. It was a long sermon, a long preaching, and a long teaching when the Messiah, the Christ, was talking. He was teaching and preaching regarding the end of the age, the coming end of the age. So, in that conversation regarding the coming end of the age, then right in the middle, the Lord places this parable, the parable of the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. But I want to raise out something, some key things out of that very important uh, parable that the Lord blessed the church with. Number one, you see very clearly, if you go through the entire Bible and the ministry of our Lord Jesus, then you will see very clearly that most of the parables that Jesus gave were indeed about the coming kingdom of God. They were about the coming realm of God. If you go through the Bible, and decide to pick out and pull out the parables, the parables that Jesus gave. All of them, really, were really talking about the coming kingdom of God. And you see, the way Matthew documents this in the book of Matthew, the way the Holy Spirit put it down in the book of Matthew, you find that he says the kingdom of heaven, as I've just read, 
the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. And by kingdom of heaven, you see that Matthew uses heaven, the Holy Spirit employs him, helps him very much to translate, to designate. He designates heaven, the kingdom of heaven. He designates heaven for God. So even as he says that the kingdom of heaven will be like and unto ten virgins, he essentially means the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is what Matthew represents here as the kingdom of heaven. And that is very important because Matthew brings out the sovereignty of the Lord. The Holy Spirit in the book of Matthew really stretches out and establishes. He extends now the might of this parable because he brings out in this parable the sovereignty of the Lord, meaning all the heavens indeed belong to God. And that's why you see Matthew says the kingdom of heaven in reference to the kingdom of God. Matthew is essentially laying a very important uh, point, is laying a very important um, uh, argument here in the sense that he's saying that the entire heavens, even now and at that time, will have been purged off anything that is not godly. We know it too well that at the time of the fall, then Satan was cast out of heaven. So Matthew, in just that first verse, brings out a very important discussion because he says the kingdom of heaven, in reference to the kingdom of God, meaning every expanse of heaven indeed belongs to God, indeed hosts the presence of the Lord. I do not want you listeners to miss out on that very important point right from the beginning. But in the way the Holy Spirit lays this out in the book of Matthew, he says, At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be likened unto ten virgins, meaning the kingdom of God, meaning the heavens enjoy the sovereignty of the Lord. The heavens belong unto the Lord. But most importantly, though, I want to raise some key, very important towers that shoot out, that stand out in this parable. And I would think that the most important part of this parable that really stands out, there, there are quite a few, but the, the one that really stood out for me is Matthew 25, verse 13, when he says, Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. And I think that is the most important warning that comes through, because if you look at the entire spectrum of that conversation from Matthew 25, verse 1, and you go all through, it pans up to verse 13. And like I say, it, it came in when the Lord was busy talking about the entire big dispensation about the end of the age. And then, in the middle of that conversation on the dispensation of the end of the age, on the occurrences of, at the end of the age, then he inserted, in the middle of that discussion, he inserted this parable, as I said. And by so doing, it would be very, very important for everyone to understand that the Lord was intending to highlight some things. That's why he placed it. He deliberately placed this parable in the middle of that long sermon, the long teaching, and the long preaching about the end of the age. And he inserts in this parable about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And I think the most important thing the Lord wanted to raise there is the following. The two things. He wanted to talk about preparedness. So you see, and as much as he's talking about the end of the age, which is really the nails down, then he brings in this about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So the first thing that he raises there is about preparedness, and when you look at the end of the spectrum, judgment. So the two 
the important towering, the, the, the tower out, the tower out of this scripture is the fact that when he places this parable at the center of that big conversation, I followed it, I saw a big conversation the Lord was speaking, uh, preaching and someone and teaching about the end of the age. So he was really talking about the prophetic timeline. But inside that conversation, he inserts in the middle, he inserts this tremendous parable of the ten virgins, five being wise and the other five being foolish. And so, because of that act of placing this conversation in the midst, right in the middle of that whole talk on the end of the age, then you see that the Lord was intent on raising out, on highlighting two very important things, points. One of them I've said is preparedness. How prepared? How should you prepare? How prepared are you? Preparedness. And the second one, at the end of the spectrum of that conversation, you see him talk about judgment, the end of the age, the massive, unquenchable judgment of the Lord that will befall the earth and the universe thereof. So, eventually, I said, after seeing that the two towers are the preparedness and the judgment, then I was so blessed when I read this. What shot out for me is Matthew 25, verse 13. When he said, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And I think that's the most important thing that shot out, that he raised very, very significantly in that conversation. In other words, he was raising that for the following reason. He was saying that there is appointed unto all men. There is an appointed day. He was raising the fact that that preparedness, that's verse 13, where he said, keep watch. After seeing what happens in the parable, the shutting of the door and the unpreparedness of the foolish virgins and the wise trimming lamps, the sharing of the oil, don't share, you know, the, 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 the fear for plunder, go buy for yourself. After all that, the most important thing he raises is verse 13. Because verse 13 is the one that now warns, warns, if there is any verse that warns this sleepy world about preparedness, why? The perils of not preparing. He warns about preparedness, the importance of preparing. However, in the background of if you don't prepare, however, if you don't prepare, the ultimate judgment that comes at the end of the age. And so you see very clearly that in that warning of Matthew 25, verse 13, the Lord is essentially speaking to this sleepy world. You see very clearly, again, that uh, if there is any verse at all in this parable that lays warning, that is warning this sleepy world, and if you look at the world today, you really see that humanity is so much asleep. If you travel to many nations, you'll find them really engaged in very busy programs about their lives on the earth here. You'll find people traveling in vehicles, even now in Kenya, and they're all focused on, I want to reach over there to pursue a program there, see my family there get married where, go to school where. So there's so much busyness that the, 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 the world, that mankind is involved in, that essentially constitutes drowsiness and sleepiness that the Lord is talking about. And when you, you see people traveling, you know, by aircrafts, by trains, by buses, by, you know, all men, bicycles, tuk-tuk, by, uh, you know, there's so much traveling, there's so much busyness in the offices, at schools, hospitals, people are working, people are involved in other things all over the business world. So if you look at the entire world in its totality, you really see that the entire world is right now sleeping. They are so busy engaged in their programs to the extent that it, it constitutes the sleepiness, the drowsiness, and the sleepiness, the nodding of heads. However, in this parable, the Lord then 
brings out Matthew 25. And Matthew 25, the Holy Spirit uses the Lord very much to raise forth those two areas. Number one, the area of preparedness and the final judgment. And because we were talking about the final judgment, the end of the age, so that preparedness comes in the middle of talking about that coming judgment. So it really becomes a wake-up call to this drowsy world on the importance of preparing, preparedness. And you see very clearly here that even the church, if you look at the Church of Christ at this hour, she's so busy with programs, these projects, and programs and uh, the Paschal services, traditional services, which are set out, like some of the churches set out from January. They set out the entire agenda of how they will run the worship and the preaching and the reading for all the Sundays across the year. So that too in the church constitutes the drowsiness and the sleepiness. And so Matthew 25, 13, now comes in handy when he says it is appointed unto all men a day a special day when one there will be death that is one of the realities that matthew raises that the, that the holy spirit raises in matthew 25 verse 13. he raises a warning unto the sleepy world the drowsy and sleepy world by telling them look there is a day that has been appointed, the day of reckoning, the day of judgment. It is the day when all men, you know, those who will be then at that instant, that moment, alive, will die. And after this, there is judgment. And he's using that to speak to the current generation. And he's telling them that the life you are living is not unlimited. A day will come when you will die, either before the rapture of the church, or after the rapture, if you are not taken. And so, still raising that very important issue of preparedness. And he says, but this Matthew 25, 13, becomes a very significant awakening to the drowsy population of this day. And he's telling them, but even as they go about their lives, through this Matthew 25, 13, even as the whole world is doing its life, but there is a day when the heavens will indeed roll up. They'll be wrapped up like a scroll, like this scroll. And the elements will melt. He says, through tremendous fervent, fervent heat and quenchable fire, the Bible puts it in Matthew. Unquenchable fire will burn up everything that belongs to this world. And so the Lord is using this again in Matthew 25, 13 to tell the world that, look, you may go on doing your business as usual, doing your life as usual. You may go on living life on this earth as though it has no limit. When you look at mankind today, when the Lord sometimes lifts me up the, above the earth and I look at the entire earth, and you see that they're so occupied with all the things they're doing, with the busyness of their lives, pursuing things, education, in hospital, business, and name it, and everything, travel. But he's saying to them essentially that this life is not unlimited. Is using Matthew 25, verse 13, to raise for the warning. He says, Therefore, keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day of the hour. Meaning, he's saying that all this will one day come to an end. And if there is any scripture at all that really raises a serious wake up call to today's drowsy world, drowsy and sleepy meaning, they are busy doing their thing. That is the sleepy, the sleepiness. That they are not alert unto the warning that the Messiah comes at the midnight hour. And then this is the scripture then that warns them. And he says, But the judgment that is coming will burn up the whole earth. Everything under the earth will melt. 
will really be burnt up by the unquenchable fire, the fervent heat, but will come from the fire of the judgment of the Lord. We have shared this very much, even as I talked about the Lamb of God and what Moses was saying when he encountered this glorious cloud that has now settled in the house. And he was being instructed on how to prepare Israel. And I've shared very clearly that when the lamb was being offered, the burning, the total burning with fire, I said that signifies the judgment of God. But that is the same fire I am talking about here. But the Lord is saying that there are for keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour. And in that keep watch warning, it was in the middle of a conversation about the judgment of unquenchable fire at the end. And so, he's using this one, the earth. He says, be careful. Please, watch out. Because all these things you're doing will one day come to an end. And those who arise should watch out. In other words, he's saying, every soul, every nation, every language, stands summoned to appear before the dreadful tribunal, the judgment, the courts of judgment of that day. The dreadful, the fearsome, fearful tribunal of the Lord. The righteous justice of God. That is what Matthew 25, verse 13, raises. He raises the fact that there is need to watch out. There is need to be careful. There is need to be prudent. Even as people are busy, wherever they are. To be careful. Why? Because every soul, every living soul... Every soul that has ever lived, he said, every soul that has ever lived, every man, some of them have gone to sleep. Every nation, every language will stand someone on that day. There will be someone to appear this, through, into this tremendous commission, this powerful, dreadful tribunal of God, judge, justice, judgment of God, to judge them righteously. And that's why he emphasizes righteousness in that preparedness. And it's very important to understand or to, uh, to highlight here that in that judgment that Matthew 25, 13 warns and therefore announces the need for preparedness, that judgment that the Lord was talking about, it is a judgment that will bring forth fruit to some people those who have done good, those who have done good, that when they stand before that righteous judgment, they will get reward, reward for being watchful, for keeping watch. And those who have not done good will be judged by the wrath of God. For them, it will be their damnation. So what then is the Lord saying, highlighting through this Matthew 25, 13? He's essentially saying, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day of the hour. Why? Because a day is coming, a day has been appointed unto man when they shall appear before this dreadful tribunal of God, commission of God, eh? this dreadful justice of God, the righteous justice. And on that day, he says, Every man will be judged according to the deeds they have done while they are in their body, in these current bodies they were. That's why he raises the warning of keep watch. So he's essentially saying, but keep watch because, hey, if you don't prepare, a day is coming when there will be either judgment or reward and to all men, because all have been summoned to appear before that tribunal, before that commission of judgment, of justice, before that court of justice, because the, before the righteous seat of the Lord. And he says, and when all will appear before the throne, some will be judged, and others reward it. And this will happen according to the deed they have done while they are in their body. Hence, indeed, this becomes the most important warning that should be a most important awakening, a wake-up call to this present generation. 
And this should also be the reason, really, indeed, for everybody, really, to pursue righteousness. You could call it temperament. But, but, but you, righteousness, righteousness, eh? you could call it temperament. But I'm saying righteousness is the key, the foundation. You know, we say that will be a righteous seat of judgment. That will be a righteous judgment, righteous throne, standing before it. All someone to account for what they did while they're in their bodies here. And so, altogether, if you look at the events that the Lord is discussing in Matthew 25, Matthew 25, the parable of the coming of the kingdom of God, that the Holy Spirit lays forth as the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, you see the Lord using Matthew 25, verse 13, that warning. Therefore, keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour. Nobody knows the day or the hour. Essentially, it is a warning on the need to be righteous, the need for this generation, if there is any reason for them to really get out of the way of their busyness on this earth, in this world, and pursue righteousness, it is this one here. But a judgment is coming. A judgment is coming, so it is profitable to stop for a moment and pursue righteousness. And he's saying, this promiscuous, this really very excessive generation, dispensation, this promiscuous dispensation, this excessive generation of providence we live in today, you know, you can see that today everywhere. It's all about provision, everyone on providence on providence. They're running up and down on providence. And I'm saying, I'm calling it this promiscuous and excessive generation or dispensation of providence that we live in today. He says, this generation of pursuing providence has brought with it something very amazing. It is a generation that has not encouraged righteousness. It is a dispensation that has not encouraged Righteous men to pursue righteousness, to continue living in righteousness. That is what the Lord is raising in Matthew 25, verse 13. That's why he's saying, please, preparedness, why? Judgment is coming. And he's raising that, please, keep watch. Why? Because if you look at this generation of providence, this dispensation of providence that we live in, where all are indeed occupied with providence, then Matthew 25, 13 becomes very key in a lacking a warning. He says, this generation of providence has been characterized by the following. He says, characterized by a lifetime in which we see righteous men and women being afflicted, being tormented. In other words, you, call, you can call it being destituted, becoming destitute. I just wanted to use only those three d demonstrations of what's happening today to the righteous. Why the Lord raised for Matthew 25, verse 13? Because of what is happening to the righteous today. Anybody that tries to pursue righteousness today, you will quickly find that you are being afflicted, you are being tormented, and you are being destituted. By who? By the wicked persons, the wicked population. You find that the wicked, it is as though this dispensation has allowed has permitted because of the occurrences of this time we live in. It is as though anyone that pursues righteousness, this dispensation has permitted the wicked to triumphantly ride over their heads. Meaning, this dispensation has put together some modalities, some instruments that makes it easier for the wicked to really triumphantly right over the heads of the righteous and surely go in dispute it. Nobody will dispute it. You know? Nobody will come and fight it. That is why the Lord raised forth the tower of Matthew 25, verse 13, as a warning. Because if you look at this generation and this dispensation where, which is characterized with providence, go to school, get a degree, get a certain job. Go to this, do this, get a certain job. Even in church, today you find pastors who solely open churches 
as a way of providence, as a way of finding a livelihood and a living, other than a calling. And you see, those who go to study what to become what, everybody is looking for a job. Everybody is looking for occupation, some kind of work to do, so that they can provide for themselves. And it has become so brutal that there is heartlessness and heedlessness. They, they don't care. The current generation, because they are being pushed by the, by, by the urge for providence, now this dispensation has now raised up this very ugly hour at which anybody that tries to be righteous, a righteous man, a righteous woman, will soon run into a situation, headwinds you can say, but a situation in which they are afflicted, they are destituted, and tormented by who? By the unrighteous. Because when you look at the laws that operate at this hour, it is as though these laws have been raised to be able to facilitate the wicked to triumphantly, right, triumphantly ride over the heads of the righteous, and that that may go undisputed. Nobody should dispute that. And that's why the Lord raised forth Matthew 25, verse 13, to rebuke this. To rebuke this occurrence. Why the world today favors the wicked trampling over the heads of the righteous. So then the Lord says, However, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day of, or the hour. You don't worry, even if they are doing this to you. You don't worry. A day is coming when there shall be payment unto them. Don't worry, even if you are trying to pursue righteousness, and they turn around, and they, they triumphantly ride over your head, and they torment you, they destitute you, and they afflict you, harass you. He says, don't worry in this Matthew 25, 13. Why? Because he says, a day is coming when all men will have been summoned to appear before the righteous throne of God. And so he says, this Matthew 25, verse 13, essentially rebukes the current state of, of, state of the affair. The current state of the affair, where the righteous cannot survive, stands rebuked. And that's what in Matthew 25, 13, that's why the Lord raised it up to encourage the pursuit for righteousness within this dispensation of providence, where everybody is pursuing providence. I think this is a very important piece that the Lord is picking out from this entire parable, and that's why he puts it in the middle of the discussion about the end judgment. So it really implies that the day is coming when God will judge the world in righteousness. And so, for those who feel afflicted, tormented, and destituted in their pursuit for righteousness by the wicked, he tells them, no, don't worry. I have raised unto you that Matthew 25, verse 13, to imply that a day is coming when the God of heaven, I will bring forth, the God of heaven will bring forth judgment unto this world, meaning he will judge this world in righteousness. And for those who have suffered, torment, been tormented while pursuing righteousness, he says, this should be solace, consolation for you, because when that day comes, when God will judge the world in righteousness, he will also administer equity unto his people. That means compensation now. He will also administer compensation, equity, so to say, unto his righteous people. Another thing that the Lord is raising is the fact that in that parable, he says that those who continue to pursue the sinful lusts of this world, the moral decay that you see in this world, 
they are the ones that at this time, I'm talking about now as we speak, they are essentially living to boldly, boldly I mean with courage, to courageously deny the coming of the Messiah. Why? Because you have seen that this world with its arrogance and the pride, the arrogance and the pride of this world, it is as though it is essentially saying that, look, the Messiah will not come. That's one of the key features that the Lord raises in that parable that I wanted to bring to your attention. So he's saying that when you look at the world, this dispensation, this generation, the way they are going about their lives, within the context of the warning of Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, and especially the warning at verse 13, then you see the Lord, you hear the Lord saying that those who pursue, consistently pursue the sinful lust of this world, the, the, those who live in arrogant pursuit of pride, as you see the world today, they are the ones that live to boldly deny the coming of the Messiah. And the Lord raises for the righteous Matthew 25, verse 13, as a consolation. He said, don't worry. Their day is coming. Their day is also coming when they shall stand summoned before the righteous throne of God, and then the Lord will dispense justice, his righteous justice on that day, and also equity, compensation, to those that have pursued righteousness despite the hostilities of the day. And inside those that indeed deny the coming of the Messiah, you find many that will profane the name of the Lord. You find the drunkards of this day. You will find the sexually immoral, the adulterers. Hmm? And you see very clearly that such like, without a doubt, they represent the foolish virgins. They represent the foolish virgins because they have not thought it prudent to wisely prepare. Where wisely means the act that those who are seeking righteousness are doing today. Wisely means pursuing your life today in the fear of the Lord. So it talks about those wisely pursuing the kingdom of God wisely in this very difficult dispensation. However, I want to get a little deeper within this parable of Matthew 25, 1 to 13. I, having said that preamble for you, I want now to get much, much deeper with you. So, like I said, when you pull out the parables of Jesus. You go through the Bible, you decide just to plow through the Bible and pull out each of the parables that the Lord gave us. I said very clearly that all of them indeed talk about the kingdom of God. And I began clearly by saying in the book of Matthew, the Holy Spirit gives us so much knowledge when he says the kingdom of heaven which implies or designates the kingdom of God. He talks about the sovereignty of the Lord over the heavens. He talks about the unassailable reign of God over the heavens, meaning the heavens belong to God. And only the godly shall have claim of a residence in heaven. Only the godly can inherit the kingdom of heaven. And so, I mentioned also that this parable sits at the center of that long conversation of the final judgment. I raise henceforth the preparedness, which I've gone through a little bit with you, how preparedness and justice and judgment are the two pillars he raises there. However, I want now to bring to your attention something much more interesting in this scripture. You see that 
when the Lord gives us that parable of Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, when I read it, I found it quite amazing. I found that the Lord was indeed challenging the church, challenging the Christians in that parable. And there are few Christian characters, characteristics, features of Christianity that you see that the Lord was putting to challenge. He was challenging the present-day Christians and church in their inclusive tendencies. Because sometimes, when you look at the present-day church, I think all the time, really, and I can speak globally now, across the ends of the earth where the Lord has taken this message. The message on the coming of the Messiah. You will find that the church is so inclusive. She has so much of inclusive tendencies on this day. When you look at the body of Christ, and then you narrow down to the individual believer, the individual believer, you'll find that the way they are pursuing their Christianity is so inclusive that sometimes they tend to include the world into their Christianity. They tend to include the world with all its moral decay and its modernism and its compromise into their Christianity. And that is what I want to highlight here. That's what I saw. That's what hit my face when I was going through during this fast. I was going through this Matthew 25, a major, major, major scripture, Matthew 25, 1 to 13, a major scripture, a major sermon that should really be sitting at the center of the church, considering the time that we have arrived at. So I found that as I went through this, the Lord ministered to me in the fact that this is a challenge that he is raising to the present day church. And this is really at the core of the message he has sent me with, the calling he has laid into my life to bring to the ends of the earth about the coming of the Messiah. I could see that very clearly here. The announcing of the coming of the Messiah, the preparedness that the church ought to embrace, and the warning on the failure to repair the judgment. But when I went deep into this scripture, then I found that this parable of Matthew 25 also brings forth a challenge onto the way the present day body of Christ is living their life. I've mentioned the righteous pursuing their righteous life and they are being triumphantly trampled upon or they're being roared, they're hurt, they're, they, the, the wicked are riding their head, and nobody can challenge that. However, that also happens in the church. The Lord is now raising a challenge here through Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, and he's saying that what is wrong with you, church? How come you can't see that in Matthew 25, 1 to 13, I raise for the challenge unto your way of Christianity? Your greatest inclusive tendencies, your tendencies of inclusiveness, where everything goes. This Matthew 25, 1 to 13 challenges the inclusiveness, the inclusive tendencies of the current day church. How does he do that? He does that. He, 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 oh, he does that. Oh, he do that. He does that. He does that by raising forth the fact that there is a group of Christians that the Bible calls the wise church, the wise virgins, that so seem very keen to embrace preparedness. They embrace preparedness having very much been aware of what judgment is coming. And then they begin to prepare wisely. But what amazes me so much is this. That as they embrace preparedness, there is another group within the church. And I know 
that group essentially in my teachings about apostasy, they represent the world, the, the merger with the world, the world that has come into the church. There is another group that is inside the church, and part of it is the, is the world, and that group is not prepared. I want you to follow me very carefully on this. How the Lord challenges the inclusive tendencies of the present day Christian in this Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. He says the following. He says that there is the wise church and then the foolish church. And that the wise church is this group, special group, that seem to be very well prepared for the coming of the Messiah. And as they are so prepared, what amazes me most is that when the Messiah comes, those who are not prepared are left out. They are left out. So, even more troubling, more difficult to understand now, more troubling is the fact that those who have the opportunity to prepare well in this scripture here, talking about the current position of the church, that it's even much more troubling that those who are in position, in advantage, who have the opportunity, the chance, to prepare well for the coming of the Messiah, they don't seem to be too keen to help the unprepared. That is indeed what I wanted to raise in this entire Matthew 25 narrative of the coming of the Messiah, of the coming of the day of reckoning. Because he says, those who have the privilege to go on and prepare very well, the Lord raises them in this scripture as not being so keen. They are not too keen to help the disadvantaged or they are prepared. I think as a church, it's very important that we read the Bible with the help of the revelation of the Lord. And if you read the Bible with that help of the Lord, then you find that this is yet another reminder to the church. But while Jesus has presented, has the, has the preacher of love, 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 the reality on the ground, however, is that he is not always that nice. Let me repeat this. But while Jesus loves all people, including sinners. But while Jesus loves sinners, he does not love sin. And that's why I put it in other words, I think that this is yet another moment, another opportunity, another reminder that while Jesus very much preached love, 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 he is, however, in reality, not always nice to sin, and by extension, to sinners. The sinners that fail to embrace wisdom, the fear of the Lord. Why? Because we see very clearly that when the Lord Jesus was talking about the day of rapture, the day of his coming, the day of of the Christ coming, the day of the Messiah's coming. He says, Church, be careful. You cannot share the anointing you have to prepare. He's saying that preparedness is individual. <laughs> that Whenever one receives the Lord and also receives the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he says, his kingdom is very generous. 
ready to provide anointing for each other person. Every other person that asks, every person that asks, Lord, anoint me that I may prepare. He is so generous that he provides for the entire earth. And indeed, he wants all of them to enter. However, because of the wickedness of the hearts of men, he says that preparedness is individual. Once you are given the anointing to prepare, then you now see the foolish virgins coming to us. Give us some of your oil because our lamps are running dry. Then they say, no, there isn't enough for both us and you. Meaning, number one, there's a high risk at this hour. The risk of plunder for the anointing that each one of you goes to church to tap from the Lord. The anointing for preparedness. He says, when you get that anointing, make sure you prepare well. Use it to prepare well. You can help others to attain that anointing from the Lord, but they cannot take it from you. And that is the misnomer, the misconception that you see today as consumed the church, where they say, come, I give you the anointing like mine. And all that fallacy that you see running around across the globe. However, he speaks very clearly here, and he says, some of them are lost. The Lord Jesus leaves some. The Lord Jesus is, however, when it comes to the return of the Messiah, not that much, in, that, that much inclusive. He is not that much inclusive. So he's questioning the church. This generous inclusiveness, the inclusive tendencies that you have adopted into your Christianity, where you are now mixing your salvation with everybody else, with the life of the world, with everything of the world, with the postmodernism of the day. He's asking, where does that come from? Because in my teaching to you, in Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, I came out very clearly that in that parable, some people are left out. And therein you see the nature of the Messiah, the hidden nature of the Messiah. And I say that is the word troubling to the fact that those who have the opportunity to prepare very well, they don't seem to be so keen to help the foolish virgin, to help those who are disadvantaged, who don't have the opportunity to prepare. And I say it, that portends, it projects to the church the very hidden nature of Christ. But in as much as the Lord, it's a reminder that in as much as the Lord has preached love and love and love and love, it is very important to be careful to note that he is not always that much generous like the church has become to incorporate the world into his Christianity. He did not. And he says, this is one point in time where the church is awaited the fact that sometimes the Lord Jesus puts the hammer of justice bang down unto us. He puts the hammer of justice down. He bangs the hammer of justice and he separates only the wise, leaving the rest of the world. And so the world, the church, the worldly church, by the way, stands rebuked on this scripture here. The next important thing I wanted to raise to your attention is that the Lord uses the word virgins. He uses virgins, the word virgins, to express the requirement on the preparedness the benchmarks, the standards of preparedness for that day. And by using virgins in this parable, you can see very clearly that the Lord is essentially referring to the purity, 
the purity that that church, that prepared church, would be hold on that day. Purity. Number two, the holiness. Hallelujah. When he uses the word virgin, when he uses it to symbolize and especially wise virgin, the two words, to symbolize the hour, the kingdom of God, the church that shall inherit the kingdom of God at that hour of reckoning. Then I say it, but when I read this, this is what came to me. That the Lord was essentially referring to the purity that that church will behold. Number two, referring to the holiness, the unadulterated holiness, the untainted holiness that that heavenly church will behold. Number three, the way he portrays the virgins here is so important. He says, they went out to meet him when he was coming. The virgins went out to meet him. But when you read the Amplified I just read, he says, when the announcement was done, and the wise virgins woke up, and the foolish virgins too woke up, and that the foolish virgins found that they hadn't enough oil, they did not have enough oil for that occasion, Amplified said that the foolish virgins walked away. They went away to look for that oil. Now, I'm using this description here to emphasize the third point why the Lord uses virgins wise virgins to signify, to indicate the events that will accrue on that day of rapture, the day of his return. And I said the first one was purity, reference to purity of that church. The untainted purity, unadulterated purity, undefiled purity, untouched purity, original purity she will behold. And I said, number two, it refers also to the holiness she would behold. Untouched holiness. Untainted, unwrinkled, unstained holiness. But the third one now that the Lord raises regarding the virgin is receptiveness. Because he says, look, the wise virgin, all the virgins went out to receive him. To receive the Messiah. But then, in the process of going out, you see now the foolish virgins, because they had no oil, they walked away, they went away. That essentially leaves the wise virgins alone, receptiveness, to receive the Messiah. So the Lord also uses the virgins, the first wise virgins, to refer to the receptiveness of the church that will enter heaven. That is the church that was in all her life very receptive to Jesus. She was always receptive to Jesus. Receptive unto the Lord. Receptiveness. Hallelujah. So, this whole parable indeed, looking at the narrative of the wise versus foolish virgin, and Matthew 25, 13, preparedness versus the judgment, it essentially raises some real questions to the current church. It asks them whether they are really prepared. Are you really prepared? I want to move on to another very important point for those who are making notes and writing and recording this. When the Lord says, when he talks about and then they went in to the wedding feast of the Lamb. 
the wedding feast, the wedding banquet of heaven. What does the Lord refer to? What does he mean about the wedding feast of the Lamb? By the wedding feast of the Lamb, you know the following. It definitely must mean that the table has been set. The table has been set. It also means that the meals have been served. And all that is left now is the preparedness. Let me again repeat this. By referring to the wedding feast, the wedding banquet of heaven that the church will come into, the righteous church, the wise church, the righteous and holy church that I referred to, that this generation of providence, which is being propelled by the urge to provide providence, that this generation has trampled on their heads and gone unassailed, unchallenged. That's why just check that will enter. The Lord says, He talks about the wedding banquet in heaven. And I say it, the imagery, the picture that comes to your mind when He's talking about the wedding banquet in heaven is the following. You see the picture of a table, a dinner table that has been set. A table that has been set for the reception, the dinner reception. All the tablecloths have been dressed up, fully white and glorious. The tables have been set, the drinks have been set. The water, the whatever it is, juices, whichever your imagery of the dinner table set. When he talks about this heavenly banquet, the wedding banquet in the kingdom of God, the wedding feast. I'll say what comes to is number one, the tables that have been well set, white tablecloths are laid. Number two, that the meals have been served on that table. And then you see for yourself that surely, 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 only one component remains missing at that table. Are you ready for that table? Only the church is missing at that table. When he sends his voice and says, I have seen the wedding day. I have seen the vision of the midnight hour. I have seen the golden clock. I have seen the coming Messiah. I have seen the coming of the Messiah. I have seen the Messiah coming. Coming to the glorious church. When all that announcements, announcements go around the globe. And then in this parable, it talks about the dinner banquet, the wedding banquet, the wedding reception. Then all that flashes onto you is the table that is set. The meals are already served. But only one component of that table is missing. Are you ready? Only the bride is missing at that table. So you see that the banquet in heaven, when you put together those three components that are derived for you, the table is set. The meals are served. And if the bride is now ready and seated at that dinner table, the holy church that will sit at that dinner table, if she will also now eventually be seated at that table that is well set and dinner served, then by referring in this parable to the wedding feast, the wedding banquet of heaven, the wedding banquet of the Lamb, the Lord was essentially referring to the kingdom of God coming to its fullness. Finally, it comes to its fullness, its fullness. 
its fruition to its completion. Finally, the kingdom of God is now complete in heaven. The bride is sitting at the dinner table for the wedding banquet of heaven. That is what the Lord was referring to. The kingdom of heaven coming to its fullness, to its completeness now, because the table is set, the meals have been served, the water has been poured in the glasses, in whichever other juices, whatever your imagery is, and finally now, the bride is also sitting at the dinner table in heaven. That imagery that comes through is the fruition, the fullness, the coming to completion and fullness of the kingdom of heaven. So my question then becomes, has the present day church in the dealings and transactions of her salvation, has she surely understand, understood this parable? Does she surely understand this parable? But this parable raises the warning on the judgment that is coming. The judgment that the Lord was talking about when he interrupted in the middle of that conversation of end of age and gave this parable, which essentially says that as the world will be aging, and making mileage towards that end of age, traveling towards that end of age for judgment. However, the rice church, for those who observe preparedness, they can interrupt that sliding towards judgment. They can interrupt it. And once they interrupt that sliding into judgment, to the end of age. Then for them, instead of sliding into that judgment, they will be required. They have a seat. They will constitute the component that will bring to completion. But now the kingdom of God has come to its fullness. Are you aware that you are part of the fullness of the kingdom of God? even as you do your life as a Christian? Are you really aware of the repercussions of your salvation, of observing a righteous salvation, despite the challenges I mentioned by the wicked of this world? Are you aware that there is a place for the church that you must fill? There is a seat for you as a Christian in the kingdom of heaven. And he's saying, that despite the presence of that seat, he has rebuked in this parable these excessive, over-generous, inclusive tendencies of the present Christian. The present church, the present Christian, they include everything of the world inclusive. They said, no. He left out. He left some people. He raised the hammer of justice and the bandit power. And some people were judged in that parable, and yet the wise church was rewarded. That means this prophecy of Jesus will indeed come to pass on the day of the wedding of the Lamb. May those who have ears, may those who have ears for listening, Indeed, listen to the voice of the Lord and hearken to the instruction of the Lord for this hour and pursue righteousness regardless of the harassment of the hour. I have seen the Messiah coming. That is why he compelled me to discuss with you this and ask you, do you really understand the fullest extent of what he said in this prophecy? Of what he laid forth in this prophecy regarding the coming of the Messiah? 
One other thing, last one, that I want to share with you before I conclude. Is the following. It talks about the sleepiness of the child. The sleepiness. The sleepiness. The sleepiness. The sleeping of the church. I will terminate this sermon for now. But next time I call, I'll share on this sleeping and the lessons learned from that sleeping that he brings forth in that prophecy. And then I'll also share with you who is this that is coming. Because the Bible calls him the Son of Man. At one place, the Bible says the first and the last. At the other, it says the living one. At the other, it says the son of God. At another place, it says the faithful and true witness. At another place, it says he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. At another end, it says the lamb. At another place, he calls him the shepherd. At Revelation 12, 10, he calls him the Messiah. At another place, he says, the faithful and true. Another place, he calls him the word of God. Another, he says, the king of kings. Another, he says, the Lord of lords. At another place, the Alpha and the Omega. Another place, he says, the morning star. And on and on and on and on, the living bread, the living stone, the living water. Next time I call to continue this discussion on the tremendous revelation from this prophecy of the coming of the Messiah in Matthew 25, 1 to 13, I will share with you deeper on the other things the Lord raised in that prophecy, the sleepiness of the church and this coming kingdom, who is coming. May the Lord bless you. May you hearken to these words. Shalom.